All right, so our next speaker is going to be Dr. Mark Kukazella. Mark is a champion in using therapeutic intervention to help patients with diabetes achieve remission. Dr. Mark Kukazella is a professor from West Virginia University School of Medicine and a retired Air Force Reserve Lieutenant Colonel. He practices family medicine at WVU's Jefferson Medical Center. Mark has developed and adopted a protocol for using a low-carb diet for patients with obesity, pre-diabetes, and type 2 diabetes. He's going to be talking to us today about compassion passion in healthcare. It's our great honor to introduce Dr. Mark Kukazella. Right. Thank you. Um, everyone here okay? Is it good? Thumbs up? All right, good. Yeah, and I want to certainly thank uh, Miriam and Chris for the invitation to come out west. I uh, spent 10 years of my life in Colorado before moving 16 years ago to West Virginia to be closer to family, so it's nice to be back in the mountains. And I want to thank uh, you all for taking time on this Easter weekend to come, you know, meet new people and make new friends and hopefully take something away that might help your life or help someone in your family's life. So a, a, a topic that I want to talk about today, uh, Eric and I gave a community presentation about two months ago, and I, I wanted to talk about something a little different, and maybe it'll relate to some of your health care experience, or if you're someone giving care, you know, whether you be a health coach, exercise scientist, just a colleague or a family member, you know, how can we help you know, interact with people to help them make change. So, so that my topic is compassion. Um, disclosures, I own a little shoe store that helps get people running. Um, I wrote a book uh, called Run For Your Life, which isn't so much about running, it's more about health. And uh, all the proceeds of that book go, go to a nonprofit which builds uh, fitness trails for schools. I'm, I'm a member with Eric of the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, Low Carb Action Network, Diet Doctors, Science Advisory, and Nutrition Coalition. So objectives today is what is compassion? And I'm going to just share some stories from the field. I, I think we've had a lot of scientific stuff, so I'm going to get a little more just personal storytelling, more narrative medicine. And I think n narrative medicine is powerful. I teach medical students because you can't understand see real stories. And if we can learn from these real stories and then go explain the science, then I think students, it really sticks. And then at the end of this, really a call to action. Um, in January, I spoke at Low Car Boca, and I, I dedicated that talk to Dr. Sarah Hallberg. Um, I've been close to, uh, with Sarah for several years, I actually spent a couple days at her clinic, and I had a, a WWSD, what would Sarah do? And um, so I'm taking that forward, and I hope at the end of uh, this conference and at future conferences, we can all share that legacy. And um, Eric shared that page that her found or the GoFundMe, so we can work on diabetes remission and continue her message going forward and, and bring it to work, you know, bring this work out to a global stage. Um, all the patients in this presentation have given permission to share their stories. So in, in medical school and in, uh, when we teach, we always talk about empathy. And empathy is, you know, I feel your suffering. But compassion is something, maybe this is the healthcare crisis. Compassion is not just empathy. It's I'm going to do everything I can to help you. And as we go through this talk, you'll see there's a difference. So empathy is that I understand what you're going through. But compassion takes that one more step. You know, I am here to help, and I want to help, and I'll do everything I can to help. And I think many of you are in this room because someone had that with you. You know, they said, not only here's a book, but here, I'm going to help you. Text me. <laughs> okay, I'm going to help you learn how to, like, they're going to go that extra yard. Um, how many, just raise your hand, how many of you are here today because someone showed you some compassion? Whether it was a healthcare professional, family member, coach, you know, someone took that extra step. So you know, if you're that person, you know what that means. You know, here's a wordsmith, uh, you know, of what compassion is. You know, I wish to see others free from suffering. That's the Dalai Lama. And maybe that's why I still go to work every day, 30 years into my healthcare career. Um, in medical care now, and, and I, think, um, I think Ben, or someone had a slide this morning or about all the burnout in healthcare. You know, we talk about this compassion fatigue, but I think that might be a little bit misguided because I never get tired or fatigued when someone comes back and they are better. That actually makes me want to come back to work. So, so maybe it's more empathy fatigue when we just get drained from that every day. But I think if we practice with compassion and people are getting better, that, that makes my day. It, it, it really does. And I'm not burnt out. You know, I think one of the models of compassion is MLK. You know, so 
out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope. So all of you out there are really a stone of hope. You know, we, all, we see all these horrible healthcare statistics. You know, Peter's showing all that horrible, you know, the global burden of disease. And now, you know, how that narrative is changing to, you know, we need to feed people more plants. And, and maybe that's misguided. But, you know, we, we have to share that stone of hope. I, I live in the most obese state in the country. Maybe we're number two, number one. So that's obesity. This, this was a... Um, one of the, the most, RWJF, we're number two, but right there with Mississippi, number one in obesity, they travel together, and these curves take off like a, state, a skateboard ramp, you know, there's diabetes um, and obesity just keeps going up, 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 and there's no flattening of this curve, you know, and during the pandemic, it's only gotten worse, diabetes is going up, and pediatric obesity and pediatric metabolic disease is actually going up in a terrifying way. Just a couple weeks ago, there was a study, over the last 20 years, Pre-diabetes in 12 to 19-year-olds has gone from 11% to 28%. Yeah, that's, that's terrifying. <laughs> and uh, in, in my state, I do work with junior ROTC. Only about one out of five high school kids in my community is actually eligible to enlist in military service. Um, and that's indeed sad because that's helped so many kids get out of a, a bad situation, helps them fund school, gives them a job skill. And now obesity is disqualifying so many kids from military duty. You know, it's what's kind of wild if you just maybe look at like a high school uh, composite from the 1950s or 60s, 70s. You know, the, it, the people look like normal people. Um, here is a video. I'm not going to show this video. If you just type in Charleston w, WV 1981-82, you'd think, well, how did they Photoshop out all the obese people? It, it, it looked pretty normal as they're just panning the street and catching people. And now, you know, in my state, you know, 40% are obese, not just overweight. It's like 38, 40% are, are clinically obese. You know, how did I get into this space? You know, I think everyone in this room has a little bit of a backstory. You know, maybe that Damascene moment where you just had to, like, re-look at things and, you know, relearn the science. So I was on military duty, and I was a, a fitness guy. I was training here. We're training combat controllers. These are the guys who jump out of airplanes and go mark targets and run out of there. You know, if you hear the term targeted airstrike, it's not some magical... IT stuff, it's a kid on the ground marking a target. And I you know, looked like this, I was a runner, I'd run marathons, win marathons, and I went in for my physical. You know, guys don't go to doctors unless they're mandated by the DOD, and uh, my, you know, you all kind of know that. Dudes do not go to doctors, right, until full catastrophe. You know, my, my blood glucose was high, and they sent me for an A1C, and it was high, it was above six. And, you know, it looked like this. It was kind of weird. And then they sent me over to the endo side, and they did this test called a C-peptide. And, you know, uh, um, Ken talks all about the C-peptide, but mine was 0.3. And if you know medicine, that's like super, super low. I was on the type 1 spectrum. I was having reactive hypoglycemia every morning at 2 in the morning for about two or three years and didn't really understand that until they put a CGM on me at Wright Pat Air Force Base just to get a little data on what was going on. And my glucoses would spike. I had an intact second phase insulin response and it would just crash down into like the 40 range. It was, but I had no idea that was going on until they put that monitor. So really within like a week, I turned the food pyramid upside down um, because I, you know, if, if you're diagnosed with full diabetes or on diabetes meds, you know, you have to go through a medical board and I didn't want to do that. And then it took me a while before I actually came back and started, you know, teaching this at a larger level at my hospital because all of us do our little N of 1 experiment. How many of you, have you all have done an N of 1 experiment? Right, are N of 1 experiments valuable? Yes, and I did a lot of N of, N of 1 experiments with my patients until, you know, we went to the hospital and said, I think we need to change the menus. So, because, yeah, you, you might be wrong, right? So, read everything I could. Pretty much every book in Peter's list there, you know, I read and read twice. You know, fork in the road. This is healthcare, right? You know, there's a fork in the road. Take it. Right, so there's a path that you can get well. Do you want to know about that path? I actually show this to patients sometimes. Yeah, tell me about that path, doc, you know. And the other way is the standard medical care, right? You got, you know, more meds, hospital care, but we, we want to at least give people the option of that fork in the road. Most patients are not offered that fork in the road. 
you know, what is not compassionate? And I think, you know, maybe some of you all that aren't in medicine have experienced this from your, your family. It's called friendly fire. You know, friendly fire in healthcare is when your own people want to take you out, right? When you're doing something a little against conventional wisdom, right? You're threatened to be fired, you're bullied, you know, you're removed from different things in your hospital. You know, and how many of you all have experienced some of that in your life? Yeah, it's because it's different, right? And you, you know, like like someone told me one time, yeah, keep doing the right thing till you get fired. So, um, yeah, I'm st I'm still employed. Uh, David Unwin is a, a man who just exudes compassion. And how many of y'all have heard of David Unwin or read? Yeah, so his, his life changed about 10 years ago too when a patient told him about how he was losing weight and getting off of meds. And he's like, that's curious. And now he also loves going to work, right? Because he knows he has, you know, the big hammer for a lot of nails. You know, as Amy was, was talking about this morning, the big hammer. Um, yeah, so we're here to bring patients hope. You know, well-controlled diabetes is the leading cause of absolutely nothing. How many patients know that? Right, we all talk about the complications, yeah. So framing diabetes, right, chronic progressive disease. No, we want to frame it as, no, this is a reversible disease, right? You can get well, you can get healthy again. You know, you can come off of medications. You know, that's new thinking. Um, yeah, empathy, you know, you know, this is not how we want to approach patients. <laughs> How's the diet going? Fuck you, right? <laughs> the day in the, here, we'll go back to that one. <laughs> and maybe y'all have experienced that in a doctor's office out there. You just need to lose some weight, right? We, you know, we're not going to operate on your hip or your knee. Just come back 20 pounds less and we'll operate on you. And you're just like, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, if you lose weight, you can come off your medicine or something. Um, yeah, the life, day in the life of a family doc, primary care, right? You know, here's your statin, blood pressure med, you know, PPI for your GERD. Oh, that sounds good, right? You know, oh, you know, we're going to cut out grains and feed you the Peter Ballastat diet of, of, you know, meat and eggs. <laughs> you know, that sounds dangerous, right? That really sounds dangerous, eating ruminant animals. But, you know, it is in the world. And, and uh, Ben here, I'm, I'm stealing Ben's slide here, you know, not eating bread, toxic pills and surgeries. It's not popular because we're in a, a for-profit healthcare system. It's fee for what you do. We're not paid to, who is it this morning? Yeah, like if we got paid, yeah, I think Ben, if we got paid to make people well, that'd be, but Verta model is actually doing that. Verta Health will only get paid if they meet certain goals with their diabetes patients. So actually, that's kind of cool. That's actually happening now, that healthcare is paying for people to get well. Because we know healthcare is reactive, right? You, we wait till you're sick, right? So if you look at a curve, right, optimal health, disease, we're up here treating disease, but as soon as you're off of optimal health is where you should sort out your end of one and figure out what it is. And many of you all have heard of the term evidence-based medicine. Right, and it's shoved down our throat. So most of our medical students are kind of led to believe that basically evidence-based medicine is just based on the mostly industry-funded trials. Like it's just, if there's a study showing something, it's evidence-based. But this is the original triad and Venn diagram of evidence-based me medicine, Sackett, uh, Canadian, I believe. But this goes back about 40 years. So there's actually three prongs. So if someone says evidence-based to you and they don't understand these three things, they don't understand what it means. So sure, I read literature, I read articles every day, and I'm constantly reading. We need to know the literature. Literature. But then there's clinical expertise, you know, so Eric is in the room here, you know, so he's been doing this for 30 years with patients, so he has thousands and thousands of patients, you know, Robert Atkins, right, his evidence-based medicine was his whole, like, yeah, I've seen this, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of times, this works, so there's that clinical expertise, and then we actually have to acknowledge the patient values, so when you're in the room with a doctor, if they're not asking you about your values, sure, I'll use medicines, but if they want to try something different, you know, tell me what your values are. You know, if you want to try this without medicine, I'm in, you know, but yeah, we want to. How many of y'all get listened to in that way that the, your clinicians acknowledge that your values? Is that happening more now? Yeah, a little bit more. That's a good thing if it's happening more. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you want to, you go in, uh, Doc, I'm doing a low-carb diet. Cool, tell me about that. How can I support you in that? Doc, I'm doing a low-carb low diet. It's going to kill you. Right? you know, so, so which side are you on? Find a doctor that will work with your patient values. You know, my mission, this was an article written in a West Virginia magazine. You know, I, my mission is to reverse diabetes in thousands of people in West Virginia. 
you know, and I think we're working this one at a time. We have a pediatric grant starting um, this week, um, getting sugar. So we're modeling, you know, within our healthcare system. So we can't provide the toxins in the hospital that are creating this disease. So we got, this is our logo. We got all the sugar drinks out of our hospital. We started low carb menus in our hospital so you can get a 10 gram carb meal in our hospital. And again, it's not universally accepted, you know, it's, it's ends of one, you know, it's kind of one at a time, you have to start training the trainees on that this exists, because the default is, you know, standard ADA diabetic diet, which is 60 gram carbs a meal. So if they don't understand this exists, they just hit, hit that. And anyone who has diabetes knows that 10 grams of carbs will raise your glucose about 40, so a 60 gram carb per meal, unless it's coming with a big side of insulin, usually is not a good idea, which it does, right? So we, we order the side, the sliding scale insulin, we call it. Um, yeah, we got rid of all the sugar drinks and the vending machines out of our hospital. We give free uh, drink options in the cafeteria. You know, and that's a nice meal, right? So. Who's going to be like hungry an hour after that meal? This is a diabetic meal there. That's like four eggs. They'll put some of that away. Like I couldn't even eat that. You know, that's a, but you know, one of the fears when we started doing this in, in the hospital was we were starting to reduce medications in the hospital, but I was getting a lot of pushback from the other side, which are outpatient clinicians, because, you know, yeah, like who's going to follow these people, right? You start med reduction and then there's no place for them to land when they leave. So in 2017, um, they opened a clinic at my hospital that allows me to do low carb. So that was a win. You know, it's not accepted widely in the institution, but amongst multiple surgeons who are referring to me, it's growing because the, my surgical colleagues are amazing because they, they're seeing this in their patients. The surgical colleagues, their patients have to meet certain BMI requirements for elective surgery, you know, whether it's a hip knee replacement or a GYN surgery. So we're working really closely with our surgical colleagues to help them lose this weight safely. And they tend to all be diabetics too. So um, it, things, things move slow, but it's moving forward. I'm just going to share some stories of just wonderful days in the clinic. Um, this gentleman's a farmer, you know, so he's... Uh, Got sides of beef going, coming in left and right, so so he's 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 set. But yeah, he came in. He was 540 pounds, fatigued, you know, and running a farm. And in seven months, he's 450. But the most powerful thing he said is he feels good. He can get up. He has to like wrestle, you know, animals. You know, wrestle. <laughs> yeah, he was just like, oh my god, like. And he's got a lot, a lot of weight to lose, but he's like, he gets it. His life has changed. He has support, and he knows there's a way out. Um, you know, wonderful. This this gentleman can't exercise at all. He needs a hip replacement. When I first met him, that uh, 457 pounds was about a year ago. And I saw him a couple weeks ago, and he was 349. But what was uh, fascinating, so they, I go grab the patients from the waiting room myself, because I don't have much staff. But I, you see, it's actually good when you go grab the patient and watch him walk, and you, you, you see what's going on. He actually got up off the chair like that. And I, and I was like, whoa, before he put him on the scale, I was like, something is really different here. You just got up off the chair like that. <laughs> First time, he had two canes. And it was like, oh my gosh, yeah. And, but it's discipline, right? It's discipline. He's, he's, he's doing it. He's changed, you know, what, what, what Don was talking about. So really, his identity has changed. He's not visualizing himself now as a sick, fat person. His, his identity is, look, this is how I eat. This is me, and I'm a well person. And uh, he's also made all of his lab markers go away. This was fascinating. I, I shared this with, with a couple colleagues yesterday when, when this rolled in. And I had not seen this. So this was a 16-year-old who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes a year ago, right after having COVID, right? So that C-peptide is, he had DKA, he's not making any insulin. He was put on about 50 units of insulin when he left the hospital. He was having all these crazy highs and lows. Um, somehow the... One of the family members had a relative who said, well, there's this doc over here who tries, who does this lower carb method. He's, you know, a high level athlete, wants to do college sports. So he came in and we, we got him the Bernstein book, you know, Richard Bernstein for type one is like six, six, 12, you know, that's your carb goals. But he, he'd leveled out his glucose is really good and was able to come off of all the insulin. It was pretty crazy. So it's like his glucose is like really good off insulin. This is a type one, almost a year out. And we reordered his C-peptide. So he's making insulin again. And this, I, have, I can't fully explain this one, but this is, this is actually something a bit new, I think, is, is that what COVID's doing, you know. So beta cell injury 
might not be permanent if it's not autoimmune attack. There's other inflammatory things that happen with things like COVID. But yeah, this it's just giving this kid hope that he can go play college ball. And now, I mean, he's thrilled. Um, we have patients who have compassion. So this is a patient lost about 150 pounds. But before COVID, he would host these groups in his home, mostly focused for dudes. You know, a lot of the low-carb cooking world is, is led by the ladies. Um, no offense there, but, but sometimes the dudes feel left out because, you know, they just want to learn some of the basics of how to cook meat. And this guy knows how to cook meat. So he would just, he was great. He would have people in his house, and he just is an ongoing advocate. And he's been, Eric knows him, he's been down to Eric's clinic. Um, this lady, Joan, um, they did a story on just how we talk to patients in the clinic, and this is one way we connect with people, is we don't sit in front of a computer, we just sit next to them. And on that clipboard, we're always like drawing like little whiteboard drawings of things, you know, making things really easy to explain. But I think, you know, if your doctor's not sitting next to you, talking to you and looking at a screen, I think, you know, it's a red flag. Here's a patient, he's, he's one of the most inspiring gentlemen I met. I met him about six years ago in the ICU. His A1C was 15, his creatinine was seven, and if you don't understand medical numbers, he's basically ready for dialysis. And uh, we had you know, kind of the 20-minute conversation. And in a couple months, his kidney doctor says, I, I don't need to see this guy anymore. It's pretty ma So he just went all in, he's a cop. And they have probably the worst metabolic disease. Their lifestyle, you know, the food at the station, you know, circadian mismatch, a lot of stress. So he's still a big boy, but this is six years later. His A1C is 5'5", metformin alone. He coaches football now, is engaged, and he's had like three promotions. He's the head of the regional jail now. So he's got, he has a future. He's not a diabetes patient now. I see him like every six months, really, just how's it going, man? And he's like, his A1C is good. And we actually wrote a paper on him as the focus of the inpatient protocol because he was really just exemplary at what the power of teaching this inpatient does on the transition to the outpatient world. So yeah, we all learned, you know, Marcus Welby days having a good bedside manner, but in the modern world, you know, I think, you know, uh, maybe a good tech side manner is what we should be shooting for because it is these, these really quick, you know, five, 10 seconds interactions really do help people. They don't take much time. And people send you just the coolest stuff. Love LCHF. Thanks for helping me get, you just get this random stuff every day and it makes you want to come back to work. Here's a patient. Sometimes when they're in the hospital, their families will start texting you and say, save grandma, right? Because <laughs> the hospital's trying to kill them. This lady had COVID, 70 year old, every type two complication. You know, so here's like day one on the hospital diet and the daughter texts me. She's like, help, help. They're, you know, they're, she had her CGM on. They're feeding grandma the, the ADA diet, and that's how much insulin she was using. And in one day, I had to, I called the hospital and did the divert. You know, I said, look, I, I phoned in, <laughs> phoned in the low-carb menu. And this is one day, look, one day, half of the insulin, no sliding scale. And she had some mashed potatoes for lunch. That's one day. Like, why aren't we doing this to every hospital patient? I mean, this is, uh, you know, a few days home, no insulin. You know, she wants to stay out of the, the nursing home, right? But that's, like, when you have sugars that high, is that good or bad for your infection? <laughs> it's very bad, right? The infection drives the sugar. The sugar drives the infection. So the only thing we can honestly lock down when someone has, like, severe COVID or sepsis is the food. You can't control that cytokine storm, the inflammatory response. You get put on prednisone, but you can control the food. So you might as well control the one thing you can control. Then you don't have, like, six variables going on. All right, this patient is this kind of almost a comical text he sent me. So he's an he, Excel spreadsheet guy. So over on the side where it says like 370, that was his blood glucose average before he started low carb. And you see that he's a pilot, right? So you see that slow descent into normalcy. And then he goes into the hospital with, with a kidney stone and kind of tongue in cheek. He's kind of showing me this is what happened, you know, when he, when he met up with, a, with an RD at the hospital and he's been given the cardiac diet, right? Just to, like in one day. It shoots them up, you know, the, the, the carb constant cardiac diet. He has stints in his heart. He has cardiac disease. But the only way out for him as a type 2 is to fix the metabolic syndrome, fix his diabetes. He's lost 80 pounds. 
you know, I think the community power is, is huge, especially those with food insecurity and, and needs. So we have a program that we're now about six years in. We started with a USDA grant, the US Duh, which usually does not do very good things for low carb. But they uh, funded us to double snap at farmer markets, which allows them also to get animal products, right? So we, they can get meat, they can get eggs, they can get vegetables, and they can double their snap. And that's growing. We have three farmer markets doing this. This is one patient. I'm going to show you a short video of him. So his A1C went from 10. Now it's 5.6. He's lost about 100 pounds. So here's his video. I don't know if we can get the volume on that. The uh, EBT program at the Charlestown Farmer's Market has helped me so much. I started my weight loss journey <clears throat> at 550 pounds. I am now down to 384 pounds. If we didn't have the UBT uh, program where it doubled and tripled the dollars, I would never be able to afford to eat healthy because health food costs more. Um, I also was diabetic, taking 29 shots a week, and my doctor has fully removed me from all my medicines. So, um, yeah, the EBT SNAP program at the uh, farmer's market has been nothing but a godsend and um, so beneficial, so beneficial. So, um, yeah, please, please keep it around. Yeah, you gotta give people hope, you know? That guy, do you think, <laughs> Do you think you got challenges? <laughs> you know, my friend Brad there has every, I mean, you name it, he has every single challenge that you could imagine as a human. Um, yeah, we give people these CGMs now, and I think this has given people hope too, and there's, it's another really good, compassionate way to connect with patients, because we can follow them remotely now with these CGMs. So we did a, a pilot study, just got published a couple months ago, put CGMs, these little guys that sit on your arm here, um, put them on for four months, new diabetes patients, no medications. You know, okay, can they actually reverse their diabetes with no medications? And in that trial, we have very low, we didn't have coaching. They had two sessions with a clinical psychologist, mostly just teaching them how to kind of focus on the foods and the, what the CGM tells them. Continuous glucose monitor, if you don't know what that means. It's just an exercise. So we really had to focus too on movement. You know, what's the effect of movement? What's the effect of food? And in, two mo in four months, two thirds of our enrollees met criteria for diabetes remission and the average A1C reduction was 1.8. So that's pretty good, right? Because the standard of care is none of them will get better. So, to, so that means just small study. We had 17 patients, but it's just, it's a paradigm. Here's one gentleman. He was a dentist. His A1C was nine when he started the trial. Then he went down to six, no meds, and he's still a patient now and uh, doing great. He's out riding his bike now. You know, this is kind of what I learned too, you know, through, a little bit through that trial, but just from my own, you know, clinical experience. And maybe some of you fit into probably one of these thirds. Um, I see a third of patients were like that gentleman I just showed you. He got it, he's all in, he does it, his life has changed. And then you and Abby chatted about some of the third that struggle, right? They're food addicted, right? They're constantly struggling, right? They'll never have that hard breakup with bread, right? They'll never divorce the bread. They'll try to kind of gateway it with things, but they'll constantly struggle. You know, in my practice too, some people get referred and they're just not ready yet, right? It's like smoking cessation. Somehow they're in your office, but they're not ready yet, right? They, family crisis, you know, financial crisis, job stress, they're just not ready to make the change. So we, I think that group in the middle, we really need to figure out how to support them. You know, what Don was talking about, trying to get them to change their identity. The third that really get it and crush it, they're good. They really don't need our help too much anymore. Um, here's a patient, and her daughter does low-carb baking, and patients are very grateful. You know, she baked me this uh, cake for Christmas, which is a low-carb pumpkin cake after her mom went from 100 units of insulin down to 10, uh, much better A1Cs. You know, you see the power of the low-carb diet, so Karen would be free to tell you she has an issue with, with food, right? She, she just has a hard time controlling the food. And when she's doing great, you see seven days versus 90 days, her average sugars, um, 
Yeah, and you see that, that variance? Look how tight she is when she eats low carb, still on a little bit of insulin, but things are much more smooth. Patients just send you pictures. So this is a patient, Lonnie, just sent me a, a picture a couple months ago, lost 120 pounds down to 235. He was a mess when I saw him. But yeah, he's one of these guys who got it all in. Um, we have what are called well, uh, well person ceremonies. It's when they've stopped all medications and every lab marker is completely normal. I mean, there's a few 12%, right? <laughs> there are a few well people left. But I think it's a great celebration. So if I can tell a young male or young female, look, you're a well person now. Yeah, just don't go back to what made you sick before, but you're a well person. And we're going to show you another video of this gentleman. He was in the uh, NFL and got injuries and just you know, those guys tend to be like all in, right? When they start binge eating, they're all in. <laughs> and when they start doing low carb and working out, they're all in. So he's down to about 278 now. Um, uh, do we have, uh, we had that video of him working out yesterday, but maybe, I don't know if you can show that one, but if, if not, he, he sent me yesterday a video of him in the gym doing this amazing routine. But he's just, he's treating his body like, like an athlete now, which is pretty phenomenal. But that's like 200 pounds down. It's a crazy amount of weight. I saw a patient in the stress te test, I do cardiac stress testing, you know, all the cardiac evaluations, and they're all diabetics, and not many of them understand the connection of the diabetes and the heart disease. So this gentleman, 40 years old, comes in, his A1C is 12, we check him, spot check glucose, he's 500, you know, he's been that high for years, really, for his A1C, has been above 10 for like five years. Strong, man. Yeah, all, you can do all that stuff. I got kettlebells in my basement. Yeah, so you can do all this stuff with body weight. You got to lift the weights. No joke. Um, yeah, this is uh, two days in to the low carb diet. He was on just 10 units of basal, which he quickly, basal insulin, quickly DC'd that. And look at his blood sugars, first week of the rest of your life. This is, some people respond in this amazing way, like two days, right? Five days in, no insulin. That looks pretty damn good. This guy walks in beginning of the week with a sugar of 500 on multiple meds. And this is like, wow, right? And... Yeah, just he follows it on, and this was a, maybe a month in, you know, just weighed uh, 249, added a lot of muscle mass, started going to the gym, he didn't have muscle tone, you know, he's sleeping better, he can see again, like it's crazy, all these other things, neuropathy gone. This is three months, right, the A1C measures three months, so this was a celebration day, look, that little tag there is our printout A1C, 5.9, he went from 12.2 to 5.9. And he, he texted me a month ago and asked what it took to go to RD school. So he may want to be an RD. So we'll see. May, I'm, I don't want to send him down some path. But I'll even share my, res, my guy recipes. So he was getting bored. So that, that, that one with the two pans there, that's my week's worth of frittata. That's got about 30 eggs right there and whatever meat's left in the fridge. So, so he, he said... The idea saved me from starvation. I must say it's better than the one I ate at your office. I gave him some at my office. Look what he put in his, right? Pork, ham, bacon, tomato, onions, mozzarella, cheddar, heavy cream, zapper for 30 seconds. Yeah, so okay, I taught him a life skill. That was the only patient, I think. I taught a life skill. He, I, I did have enough for myself for lunch, too. Um, this is another lady I met at the stress lab, came back to my clinic two years later, cardiac stress lab, and she said this, I didn't recognize her, and she said, you met me before, and I said, I don't, re I don't remember, he said, you told me when I was ready to come for a visit, you're the only doctor who's ever not shamed me, you know, so two years before, she was getting a cardiac workup, we had a nice conversation, and she was ready, so she came back when she was ready, and uh, and that day she came in the clinic, she hadn't taken her morning insulin. She was taking 100 plus units twice a day, but she thought she was going to get lab work done, so she didn't take her insulin that morning, and we checked her sugar. It was 125. She hadn't eaten anything. I was like, hmm, let's try this, right? Let's <laughs> see. Yeah, curious. Right, so within two days, no insulin. These are her glucose readings. Right, and now she's about, maybe about four months in, she's still off insulin. Right, you know, but these were our daily exchanges. We put a monitor on her right away in the clinic so she could see it because we don't know, right? 
Like the only way to know is you, got, you can't do episodic care. You can't say follow up in three months. You know, when they're on that much insulin, like daily communication, you know, what's going on, right? So yeah, it's, it's totally safe as long as you can follow these patients. You know, here's a former Marine military guy. He didn't understand his diabetes. So he was on 55 units of insulin, about three medications, A1C of eight. Six weeks in, his A1C was down to 5.8, and that didn't even give it full time to correct. Just metformin alone, and now he's not on any of, of the medications. You know, he texts me, I quit taking the insulin. Diet's definitely, uh, th through diet, definitely needed work. You know, one thing I learned CGM is Dawn effect. So they learn a lot from the CGM about how their bodies respond to the sugar. And when they have these questions, we can help explain it. A lot of them, their sugars will kind of go up in the morning without eating. A lot of them have never seen that until they put the monitor on. You can say, that's cool, right? It comes back down, that's your morning cortisol. A lot of them have sleep apnea too, you know. Yeah, so I love this thing here. People I've talked to have been amazed what simply cutting carbs and sugar will do. This is not that complicated, right? This is, he's a marine guy, right? This is not that complicated. Get rid of the sugar, uh, get rid of the, the carbs, and you can do amazing things. Yeah, and there's his blood sugar readings, perfect. Um, this gentleman, too, it's amazing also, which we see with some of the other labs, especially um, triglycerides. Um, actually, you know, this is another guy who was an orthopedic patient, so he was on 200 units of insulin, A1C8. We put the monitor on him, and this is what's happening with just one dose of about 30 units of basal insulin, and this is where he's at now, you know, perfectly smooth um, glucoses. So when they learn how to eat, some of them do need to maintain the insulin. They're so massively insulin resistant. This guy's getting prednisone injected into joints almost every month for his, whether it's his neck or his back or his knee. So he's got a lot of things, but he knows when he controls the, uh, the diet, he can keep in that green zone and he's learning. Um, this gentleman here is a father of three. He did not want to take insulin, right? He's like, I don't want to go that. I don't want to inject into myself. So we supported him. You know, A1C was 10. Eight weeks later, his A1C was 7'4", 15 pounds down, feeling good. He's an engineer, had, didn't have brain fog. And this is what you can see. This is uh, two months in. You see that red there, the triglycerides? He was undetectable, 1,400. And he's down to 340, so he's working it, right? In a couple months, his, that's his liver, the silent scream of the liver. His liver is unpacking. Now, that HDL takes a while to come up. So he's at huge cardiac risk, right? When you look at that triglyceride to HDL ratio, being a 40-ish-year-old guy, huge, huge cardiac risk. So there's only one way out. Um, this is an engineer from the orthopedic clinic who needed knee surgery. You know, his lipid panel's better. 65 pounds down, this diet works. I know now what the cause of my weight gain is and how to do something about it. So yeah, he, he doesn't need help anymore. He's good to go. He learned it. He's an engineer. Um, there's a medicine, semaglutide, I use a lot for people with that binge eating. And you can see some immediate, uh, immediate results with that. It somehow really affects the satiety. This is a couple days, same patient, just uh, the use of uh, starto semaglutide. Um, double diabetes, these are the type 1 patients who actually become insulin resistant from the diet and all the big doses of insulin. But so, and some of these, the semaglutide can work. He says, yeah, this shot does great because th that's really the, a disastrous uh, complication is when you have type 1 and type 2 in the same person. Uh, this gentleman here, was a se he was septic in the hospital, A1C of 13, wasn't able to exercise at all, right? He'd never even, like, been an exerciser, and now he's going to the gym almost every day, A1C of 6, no insulin, exercising. These are his sugars. Been off insulin now for about four months. His weight's down. He still thinks he wants to lose more weight, and I, I don't want him to lose more weight. I want him to keep his muscle, but as long as he's keeping his sugars good, um, kidney transplant patients, you know, we see these. These are like the sickest people. And this is one who was discharged from the hospital and then made his way into my office. He was on five different diabetes medications and really didn't understand them. And this, he had already had one kidney transplant. And now he's on, you know, hoping not to need another one. And this is a, you know, a few weeks in, his creatinine had come down. But how many of y'all have been confused by your medicine regimen? Yeah, imagine if you're a kidney transplant patient, right? It's like really complicated. And this guy did road work. You know, he was not medically sophisticated, but he was an intelligent guy. So he's, uh, he sent me a picture of this over text. It's a, it's a humalog, which is an insulin pen. And he says, isn't tr trulicity the insulin? 
mean, he's discharged from the hospital, right? And it's like, oh my God. Like people have loaded weapons out there with these medications, no joke. Um, but yeah, so we, we call it minimally disruptive medicine is when we can make their medical care less disruptive to their lives, simplify things, right? As doctors, we always want to intensify the therapy, right? But from the patient's perspective, maybe that's not the right thing. My life is already intense. I got three kids, two jobs, this, that. You know, now you want me to do this shot four times a day, this one three times a day, check my glucose, get my eyes checked, check this, that. They don't, it's not real, right? It's not, it's, it's not real. It's magical thinking that the patients are going to do this, um, yeah, here's, I mean, these are just multiple patients. This is another lady we follow. She's amazing. You know, she was on 200 units of insulin. Now she is off of all her insulin. And you see what the low-carb diet does um, to that blood sugar. It's like flying a plane. This is one week in, you know, and, and this is right the brown rice. You know, she's learning. She texted me this, brown rice with chicken. I said, yes, the rice will do that. She was wondering what was going on. I thought being brown rice, it would be better, but I guess not. <laughs> like, no. But she didn't know until she put the monitor on, right? Perfect day, perfect day. Today's a perfect day for a perfect day. Wake up every day and say, today's a perfect day for a perfect day. 83 is a normal blood sugar, right? Not 120. <laughs> so maybe some people could actually achieve normal blood sugars. And you know you're helping a patient when they want to bring their mother in to see you. <laughs> and her mother's been diabetic for 30 years, an African-American female. Diabetes is disastrous in the African-American community, especially amongst females. Yeah, we, we want to help people. You know, this is like one day of a patient and they start texting you. Can't tell you how much I appreciate you opening my eyes. This is his wife giving him a snack. And I saw this gentleman last week. His A1C had went from 11 down to 7 in about four months. He has a cardiac stint in. So, like, there's no other way out but fix your diabetes. Children, I see children too. Children are... A mess. And a lot of them, their home environment, their parents have issues with food. This is the mom texting me. I've had issues with food my whole life as well. Um, yeah, so, so we kind of have to support the mom and the child because they eat together. You know, and a couple days later, she's, we actually, she was terrified to check her sugars. But, but she, she did it, right? You, gotta give, you give them a hug for doing it because it's hard. Yeah, like they have to check their sugars. You know, and that's not to tell a teenager to check their sugars. To us, it's like pretty routine. But to them, it may not be that, um, yeah, just here's a, a daughter put one of these monitors on her mother um, who was having issues. And uh, yeah, this is teach, trying to teach her mother approximately one hour after dinner, she said to thank you for the bread recommendation. This was a bread addicted patient. So she did try a, you know, a slice of that 647 because she wouldn't get rid of the bread. So it didn't really budge her. So I talked a lot about food here, but I think I also want to emphasize, I love movement and exercise. So it's kind of like with Bronson's approach. I think if we've taken this kind of weight-centric approach a lot, so I'm just going to kind of diverge a bit on exercise. So let's talk about just a fitness, health, overall well-being approach. Because we know if we can get people moving and stronger and healthier, it helps everything. This is a great paper. The uh, guy's name is Gazer. He's out in Utah, I think University of Utah. But no matter what your body weight is, if you're fit, your all-cause and cardiovascular mortality goes way down. So if that's you and constantly you're struggling with the scale and every day it's a battle with the scale, get fit. Right? Improve your metabolic markers because if you can get fit, right, how, you know, can you go walk 12 minutes you know, and cover more ground? You know, we call it metabolic equivalence. You know, we measure that in the stress lab. You know, as they go from Bruce stage one, stage two, stage three, just how far they can walk is a powerful marker of how long they're going to be on this earth. My last couple minutes, hope for the future. So med students and residents, you know, Eric and I in our clinics, you know, we take these young learners in because, you know, that's really the future. You know, I mean, people have said, even Robert Lustig, we basically have to wait sometimes for the institutional thinking just to retire or die off. And the only way out of this is to teach the young learners, you know, maybe teach them a little bit of the basic science of, you know, what, what Peter was talking about. Let's talk about just food, you know, and food policy and malnutrition and, you know, and agriculture and husbandry. Like, like we learned nothing of that in med school, but I think it's important for global health. You know, this is, brings me hope too. So Verda Health is now contracted with West Virginia University. So West Virginia University is the largest employer in the state of West Virginia. And now if you're an employee of West Virginia University and you have type 2 diabetes, you can get Verda for free. Verda only gets paid 
if they meet successful markers. You know, the markers are med reduction, weight loss, and A1C reduction. So that's a win, right? So, so by getting people better, the patient wins. I mean, the reason they did this, it saves money because healthcare costs are off the rails. You know, diabetes patients miss work. They're the biggest eighteen dollars to $20,000 per year to care for a diabetes patient. So if we can help these people. So that was just, wow. Like, this is happening. It's happening. So hang in there. Yeah, partners with Verta Health, right? This is in their own... Yeah, it kind of validates a little bit about what I was doing. You know, you're kind of in this little silo doing something, and now they just acknowledge this. You know, this is uh, crossing the chasm, the tipping point. I gave a talk maybe eight years ago. You know, there was some early adopters of this. I really thought we would be, you know, early majority would be doing this by now, but we're not quite there yet. So it's up to you to, to get us from these early adopters, which is you guys in the room, to the early majority. Then it's like, oh, yeah, we knew this all along. You know, but that's about a 30-year process. And maybe we're at about year eight to nine, maybe. I, I, I don't know. We probably could hypothesize that. You know, be kind. You know, healthcare is hard. Please be kind, you know, so be kind to others. You know, I try to be kind even to the people that, you know, want to take you down and attack you. You know, you just tr treat them with kindness. You don't fight back. You just show the results and, like you say, you know, keep doing the right thing until they want to fire you. Yeah, and this, I mean, really, this is the hill I will die on. You know, it is. So Sarah Hallberg legacy, you know, so we will keep fighting for this, right? Never, never, never give up. You know, we can't heal the world today, but we can begin with a voice of compassion, a heart of love, and an act of kindness. You know, and if you're out there, you know, in whatever job you have, healthcare, coaching, you know, you have your life, you know, take care of yourself first as, as you help others. You know, I've got a strong, uh, my father had a bypass at, at age 35, another bypass as a defibrillator in. I've got a lot of stress in my life, but knock on wood, you know, my don't have any plaque in my arteries. That CIMT test out there is another, it's an amazing test or a coronary calcium, you know, get an idea of what your arteries look like is, is if you're getting into, like, geriatric age like I am. I'm 55, but it's just uh, take care of... Uh, I know you're like, what? <laughs> Put your own oxygen mask on first. This is a little book, you know, because I, I deal with underserved populations, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, you know, folks who have food insecurity. So this, you can download this book for free. Christy Sullivan um, helped me with it with some really cool recipes. It's called Low Carb on Any Budget. That's a little tiny URL. You can print it. Walks through med reduction. I, I have this in hard copy. I give out to every patient. It's kind of like the 101 level. Then I send them to Diet Doctor Keto for Beginners as kind of the 201. How many of y'all have gone to that page, Diet Doctor Keto Beginners? Yeah, that's like really good. So I kind of lead them in with this little book, and then I get them to Diet Doctor. I think that's it, yeah. Imagine in, if in 20 years, you know, wow, we used to let kids have sugar, you know, <laughs> just like tobacco. But um, that's all I got. I thank you all. Thank uh, Chris and Miriam. I got through it. Minute went a minute long. <laughs>